Well, well, this is a little test bed for a new idea for how to do a session, which um, may or may not work. But um, <laughs> what we're going to do, Tim and I, is to interview each other, um, which may show that having a proper interview is a much better idea, or maybe it'll be uh, a, a, an approach that works, and maybe next year Kevin Ligo will interview Charlotte, and Charlotte will interview Kevin. We'll see. Um, Tim and I have had a somewhat similar career in as much as um, we've both been the creative heads of large groups, in his case a particularly large group with Endemol, uh, and we've both had experience, him more recently, of setting up an independent production company. So it seemed like a good idea to talk to each other. Um, we, we, we also share, probably the most important thing we have in common is that we both started our careers working on food and drink. Um, a TV show that Peter Bazalgette was responsible for. I didn't know you worked on that. Yeah, I worked you? on it when it was uh, at the BBC, in-house. Um, I think I modernised it a bit when I took over, but <laughs> it was... It was um... Um, anyway, let's start off. We're, we're, I'll ask a few questions of Tim, and then he'll start asking a few questions of me. we have trying to cover these kinds of subject areas, so let's start off by talking about starting up a little indie. I hear you've just started up a little indie. I have, Stephen. Yeah. And, uh, quite a big little indie. You've got quite a lot of well, people that you're having to find. Well, it's, find. it's no bad wolf, but um, <laughs> it's topical reference if you've read The Times. Um, it's, I don't know if it's a big indie in the sense that... Well, I'm, I can hear myself talking and I've, I'm going to start again, that sentence. <laughs> I'm actually just going to start the sentence again. It's fine. It's our, it's our format. So here we go. Stephen, good to talk to you. Um, Thank you for the question. We decided, Peter and I, Peter Fincham, that starting an indie felt like the right thing to do. Both of us wanted to do it for different reasons. And when I left Endemol Shine, I took a bit of time to think about whether that was, you know, what, what kind of form that should take. And I think the thing I learned, at, at particularly Endemol, where I spent most of my career was that sometimes it's quite good just to sort of go quite big in the sense of really go into something um, and really sort of go full tilt and it doesn't mean it's going to work but you kind of feel you've given it everything and I think both Peter and I thought look there's no point in us sort of setting up a you know above a pub in a room and just sort of trying to um, get people to return calls and all the rest of it why don't we start with what we love which is being surrounded by really brilliant creative people so when, when, I thought, when I thought about what, what the indie should look like and what a new company should feel like, all I could think of was actually in a funny way thinking back to Endemol, which is when I was sort of the most happy and when I felt it was most right was when I could look out from my office. Door was always open, Stephen, but uh, look out from my office. Um, and I just saw all these incredible people doing incredible things. And I thought, God, this is like the best job in the world. Um, and I thought, well, I wonder if you can do that. With a, with, a, with a startup. I wonder if you can start by being surrounded by truly brilliant people. So, Peter and I being together, we thought, well, there's de definitely, everyone knows there, there is money out there, but you've got to get the right sort of money and you've got to get the right sort of backing. And we wondered if there was an appetite for starting something in the way that you really shouldn't start something, which is with quite a lot of people. Um, it's and a very big overhead, you must have. I call them people, Stephen. You call them overhead. Um, <laughs> Um, that must be a very big overhead. How long have you given yourselves before you have to break even? Until next Wednesday. So, <laughs> things, are not things are not looking great. Things are not looking great. So this is, this is a proper question. Seriously, how, yeah. how long have you given yourself? What, what's your business plan? Do you think that you will be breaking even by the end of the year? Or uh, no. have you given yourself two years, three years? How it's, long? It's, um, you know, obviously without going into it, but it's, it's years. And it's sort of, let's say, three, four years. Um, something of that magnitude, because partly because when we put the plan together, I thought the one thing I don't want to do is immediately start with sort of horrendous targets hang, hanging over you. And, and, you know, part of part of the motivation for doing this was about freeing up a bit and being free to pursue projects that one cares about. And um, of course, hope, you know, hope that some of them are going to turn into great big hits, but also just wanted it to be fun. And so we were very specific when we put the plan together that we should have a really realistic timetable. And so, yes, it did therefore take a relatively large investment. And our investor has taken 
of the company, and it's a, for, for the TV startup world, it's a relatively large investment. But we were very, obviously very open about that, very clear about that, and we felt that over time, with patience and with you know, pursuing the right projects, that we will, you know, will absolutely be profitable. It'd be kind of crazy if we didn't want to be. And we'll, we'll get there. But we certainly, I mean, the first year, I think, we have, off the top of my head, I think we've budgeted for sort of a project. One project? Yes, a single which, documentary. I'm, which I'm not sure we're going to get. Uh, no, which um, I'm hopeful, if we didn't get, would be, well, we've got. Have you got um, any commissions? Yes, thank you. Have you announced any commissions? Yes, we announced... Um, so we announced the first bit of telly we're going to make, which is the, which is a, um, we're part of a, a charity match, a sort of um, for for Grenfell to raise money for for Grenfell, which for Sky One. Um, so we're doing all the live entertainment around that match, and lots of celebrities are going to play. Jarvis Cocker is going to play, which is still extraordinary thought, right? Uh, maybe not to you, Stephen, I can, from your face, but I found that extraordinary. Um, amongst others, so we're doing a sort of celebrity football match, which is a very, very original format that no one's ever done before. Um, and, um, and then we've got a couple of other things coming up, so yes. Has good. it been difficult? When do I get to ask you something? Oh, you can ask me a question right, right. now. What's your next question? I was gonna... <laughs> That's enough about talking about you. Let's ask some questions about Stephen. you. Um, no, seriously, uh, I was going to, my final question was going to be, has it been difficult getting the people? Have you found it easy to persuade people to come and join you? Um, and what kind of deals have you had to do with them to get them to come and join you? So, um, th there are two people who joined um, us, uh, who some of you might know, Nick Mather and Nick Samuel Smith, who I'd worked with for a long time, Endemol and Endemol Shine. Um, and, and it's brilliant that they were able to do that. Beyond that, both Peter and I sat down and said, what, what would be great here would be to basically work with people we've never worked with before, because um, that feels quite an exciting thing to do and sort of maybe a bit risky, but feels like a new chapter. It would be great to do that. So we actually, I've never done it before, in, uh, sort of personally, we did it as a company, but we used a headhunter to go out there and ask, you know, and find people and see if people were interested in, in, in joining us. And we were... I can tell you that basically we did these interviews with people, you know, when, who were who interested in different areas, factual and drama and documentary and so on. And um, it was genuinely ridiculously exciting thing to do, to talk to people about what their ambitions were, what they, you know, what wasn't working for them, perhaps where they were and what was working. To say to them, look, we're doing it from scratch and, you know, I'm sure people are saying, you know, well, you've got all sorts of advantages, you know, but, but it is from scratch and we haven't got any IP and we don't have any shows. And the people who, the first person to join, I think the first person to join us to, was, was someone called Neris Evans, who was comedy at Channel 4. And she, we were never sure because we hadn't done this for a while, you know, how you exactly tell whether someone wants to join you or not. You sort of, everyone's saying nice things, a bit like a meeting in America. Everyone's being incredibly nice. We think, I wonder if they actually are going to say they want to do it. And our headhunter uh, phoned us the next day and said, Neris would like to do this. And I can, I'm not afraid to tell you this. I felt like an incredible well of emotion about that, thinking, Christ. She's like got a proper job at Channel 4 <laughs> and she wants to come and we haven't even got an office and we've got all these hopes and ambitions for it, but she actually wants to join us. And the headhunter said, would you, what would you like to say? And I said, well, could you just say, thanks very much. <laughs> that was the message. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Then I thought we sounded a bit weak. <laughs> so I said, also point out she's made a terribly good decision for her career. But it was a really lovely thing. And I think that's when, and I'm now going to come to you, that's when you realise that doing your own thing, whether with a partner or not, is, is, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work, but it's incredibly personal in a way that being in a bigger company, however much fun that can be, increasingly becomes less personal. You sort of care a bit less and you suddenly care about all these things that you know, you, perhaps you hadn't done for, for, for a long time. So I found that incredibly invigorating and still, you know, still six months on, I can tell you I'm still in and enjoying it. Um, um, it's been a long road. Um, so, so wonderful. So Stephen, in this arguably slightly clunky format, but let's see where I then go from being questioned and turn to you. Um, you've, did, you've, you've done this all a long time ago. I mean, you've done it a couple of times doing your indie, you know, start, starting up your own thing. What is it about you, do you think, that's attracted you to that? Because you could sort of be but you were at the BBC and you could have stayed there forever, many people do, but there's something in you, I guess, that made you think, I want to be, do it on my own, take responsibility for my own, what, 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 what is that, do you think? 
Um, yes, I was, <coughs> I was at the BBC for 16 years uh, in the documentaries department, and it was, it, was, it was a wonderful place to be. We were able to make documentaries all over the world, and uh, it was fascinating. And then I became an executive and ran a strand called Modern Times, and was given delegated commissioning, which doesn't seem to exist anymore, so that I could actually Ooh, commission controversial guys, controversial. programs um, in the room with people who had good ideas. But the independent sector was getting stronger and stronger, and it was, it was a time of, of, of Bert's changes at the BBC, and it felt that that autonomy that one had was beginning to erode, and the, the rise of the schedulers was getting... Um, stronger and stronger. So that sense that one had the freedom to be able to commission or to do things without having to account in the most often abstruse way was making the BBC less attractive place to work in-house. Um, and at the same time I was seeing people setting up, um, my colleagues in the documentary department uh, set up Lion and that was doing well. Many other people were setting up independent production companies. My father had run a commercials production company all his life and I'd always thought I would be an independent at some point um, and then I commissioned RDF to make a Modern Times and RDF had just got going, David Frank was, was running it and the two of us got on very well and I, he made, he, 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 he suggested I came and join them as their head of programmes and it was a, it was a great, it was a great way into the independent sector and and what, what do you, presumably you're a very, because you have an annoying number of hits sort of on a regular basis, which I have personally found quite difficult to cope with at times. Um, <laughs> presumably you are a very competitive person, are you? Do you find yourself competitive? Do you find yourself driven, I suppose? Is, 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 that, is that a way of thinking about you? Is that? Um, yeah, I mean, you're, we're all playing a game and, and, and it's not much fun playing games if you don't win. I mean, I, I don't think of myself as being competitive in the sense of, oh, I've got to do better than others. I think of myself more as um, this isn't going to function what we're doing unless we persuade people to give us the money to make these programmes. So, I mean, I feel competitive in the sense that um, I get depressed if there isn't good news regularly. Um, You're in the right I, business then. <laughs> I, I, I tell people I have a big wooden box in my office and it's where I keep good news and if there's nothing in there this week or this month, I get depressed. Do you work with children? <laughs> it's like, do they actually believe you? Um, that sounds a bit weird. But, um, <laughs> Do you, but but well, it, we're sort of effortlessly moving into the sort of pitching it because I'm yes. sort of, well because I'm thinking about what you said there and and do you do you get um, I mean do you get depressed and disappointed and because I, I suppose for some people they look at people in the industry and think well you've had this many hits or you've got this job or that job you know and and, and actually so you're someone who's got any number of hits you could sort of stop now and and be good luck to anyone who tries to beat your record of, of you know, in, in, in terms of what you've achieved. But do you get, you know, are there days when you think, oh, for fuck's sake, you know, I can't get stuff through, I've been pitching, I, you know, this, this is a great idea, but it's not getting anywhere. Does that, what do you do about that when you feel like that? How, how, how much do you feel that? Um, I feel it when, if I fall in love with an idea, I'm usually pretty confident I can sell it. And I'd say most of the time, if I fall in love with an idea, I can sell it. Uh, it's just quite difficult to fall in love with an idea. Um, I think one of the difficulties, if you've been around for a while, is that you've heard most ideas, or you've heard a version of most ideas. And I think one of the things that I keep trying to stop myself doing is kill an idea too early, because um, I've seen a version of it. Um, when, when Tim Harcourt first came into the office after the London riots and said, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to see how people were watching the riots at home? I said, oh, it's been done. Um, Jane Root and Michael Jackson did a programme called On the Box. Uh, when Channel 4 started, they put cameras inside televisions and they, they, they explored all that. And it, amazingly, people didn't seem to be watching television most of the time. They were ironing or arguing or not in the room or making out. Um, and it was an interesting programme. We kept talking about it, Tim was keen, and then quite soon it evolved into something else. We realised, actually, this wouldn't be a sociological study of how people watch television. It was actually an opportunity to, to, to find a bunch of characters, uh, a very varied bunch of characters around the country, and that we could turn this into 
a, a weekly soap that was picking up on the national conversation of the week because people talk each week about what's on television. And television also is their main source of the news, so it gave them something. They were, meant they were not, not just talking about television, but they were also talking about the news. So um, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's wonderful and very, very exciting when you find an idea that you really believe in. And I think if one believes in an idea, it's not that hard to convey that conviction to people, and most of the time, they, they, they will buy. Um, but if you, if you <clears throat> having said it's hard to fall in love with an idea, and as you say, that there's, you know, however many, there's seven ideas out there, and then they all have different iterations or whatever it might be. How, do, I suppose, drilling down on that, how do you, what do you say, you know, what's your sort of approach? Because you're thinking your first reaction is, well, I've seen something a bit like that. Is that about your team? Is that about the Tims and so on? You've, you've empowered them to say, look, I'm, I'm one keeping thinking about this and therefore you have to listen to them. Is it about a sort of, you know, how do, is, that, is that what it's about ultimately? Yes. Developing, not giving up on something. Yeah, I mean, it, well, it's also about empowering people. I mean, um, the days of modern times, the, often the best documentaries to be made with the in-house team were ideas that I didn't think were very good. But the people that wanted to make that idea were so passionate about it that, and I believed in their passion and I believed in them, that I would often give them the chance to make it and they'd prove me wrong and it was a great, it was a great program. There's an interesting, I, th I think we'll maybe talk about commissioning and so on. It says up here we will. Yeah, I want to ask you a couple oh, of questions about pitching. Sure. I think but the audience would like that. <laughs> I'm interested in how one pitches from the point of view of, do you, do you go and meet people and present lots of ideas to them, or do you think it's more important to have a particular idea that you really have thought through um, and that you, uh, you, 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 know, you might make, make, maybe make some tape or something? In other words, how, how scattergun are you in your approach to pitching and how... How, how focused? I try, uh, so try and be focused is, is, is the way I, I, I would have always done it. I think it sort of slightly depends, having said that. There are some, aren't there, commissioners and maybe channel heads who have a slightly broader overview where, who respond quite well to here's five or six things we've been thinking about um, and, and we want, you know, which, I'm wondering which ones sort of float your boat and then we can take them further so there's so I think so I think there's probably two, so, so there's the sort of what is that it's a sort of gentle neo pitch it's sort of not quite the full-on pitch it's the sort of here's areas half-baked uh, loaf the half-baked loaf and and I think for me if you're going to do that you should however if if the person then says well I quite like that you should have something underneath it so I don't think it can just be a sort of yes we thought about maybe doing a game show and they say, well, yes, I'm looking for a game show. Good, excellent. Well, I will perhaps come back with one. You don't want to be in that situation. So I think occasionally you can do that. But I think more often, I think it's much better but scarier to say, here's a thing. We want to come and talk to you about a thing, a, a show, or maybe two. And it's a hard one, isn't it? Because that's the, your point about falling in love with it. I think you've got to absolutely fundamentally believe in it, have stress tested it, No what you're going to be asked, you know, if, if, if it's got something in it that feels, particularly with formats, that feels like, yeah, but if that happened, the show wouldn't quite work. Yeah, but it'll only happen once every thousand shows. Yes, but it'll probably happen in your first show. You've got to, all that stuff that you, you'll know, as well as me, if not better, um, is, is, is very important. But I like to go in basically with one or two things and then know that there's every chance that one minute in, they might say, yeah, we've, we're just doing something just like that and the whole thing collapses. But it's, I'd rather have that. And how promiscuous will you be with an idea? You, because um, I mean, it, it, the big, we're meant to be talking about it later, but the big difference between Britain and America, I think, is that in America, they expect you to come in with a pretty f um, thought through idea. Um, and, and which is why we have a big advantage as, as British producers, because we often had a chance to make the show already here. But they also expect you to expose that idea to everybody, to all your competitors. In yes. fact, it's downright rude if you don't offer it to the competitors because they feel, well, why weren't we given the opportunity to bid on that idea? Whereas in Britain, um, it's, it, that hasn't been the way programmes have been sold generally. I mean, maybe to some extent a bit more in entertainment, but certainly in the factual entertainment world, um, 
people sell ideas by kind of getting into a huddle with the commissioner mm. and sort of creating it together. And the minute you start that kind of relationship, you can't take the idea anywhere else because it, it, they're, all, they're, they're already involved in it and, and that's the kind of the yeah. deal. There, there are upsides and downsides to that. I mean, on one hand, you get their buy-in. On the other hand, you're kind of stuck with them. And however slow it is for them to, or, or to, to decide to buy it, or maybe in the end to decide to reject it. So I, I find I'm quite torn as to whether yes. or not one should go down that road, or, which we are sometimes doing now in Britain, where you do get an idea to the point where you feel it's pretty watertight, and then you go and present it to people, but you tell them up front in Britain, oh, but we are showing this to the other broadcasters. Yes. What, what's your approach to Yeah, that? no, I've, I've, I agree with you saying it, I, I feel torn, because, because I think some of the best ideas I've ever been involved in have absolutely come from that process of a constant dialogue with a commissioner or a channel head or whatever, and saying, we're looking for something you know, like this, and then you start that conversation. And therefore, it would be downright rude and inappropriate and suicidal to say, oh, by the way, we've, I've taken that somewhere else. That's clearly something you've... And I really enjoy that process. And, you know, I don't know how often... I don't know if... I, I honestly don't know... Because obviously I'm in business now with someone who's been a commissioner, Peter, so it's quite interesting hearing his... You know, his, from that side, his, his views on it. But with... I wonder how often commissioners know how exciting it is when they talk to us and say, we're thinking about something like this and engage with you. It's like literally the most exciting thing that happens all month, isn't it? Or maybe I just, just have more fun outside of work. But, um, <laughs> but I think it's amazing because you're thinking, right, what do, we, what do we want? You know, what we want, we want to fall in love with our ideas, we want to change the world with our television programs, but mostly we want to get stuff on. We want to make it, because that's what we're doing. We don't want to commission. Brilliant people commission, people are drawn. Neither you or I, I think it's fair to say, are drawn to the notion of being a broadcaster. I need to ask you in a minute whether you are going to take the Channel 4 job, but I don't want to give you any warning about that, because it'll take the sting out of it. Um, so so we, we're not drawn to that. What we like to do is make stuff, and, and for whatever reasons in, 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 within us, that's what we want to do, along with all our colleagues and teams. So the idea of a, of a commissioner or a broadcaster saying, you know, let's sort of work on something together is brilliant. That said, as you say, we found ourselves talking about this the other day, as we talk about America, which also is up there somewhere. Um, we've, I've spent years sort of slightly thinking, this whole business with agents and so on, sort of madness, absolute madness. It's so impersonal, you go in and you're not really giving it, you know, you're sort of basically presenting a tape and saying, this is how it works. And as you say, it's gone to 10 people and the agent's doing most of the talking, you know, or the deal making, sort of mad. We found ourselves talking in the, the office the other day saying, wouldn't it be great if that happened here? There's a sort of, because there is a massive advantage to that, which is, here's a show you've, as you say, you've created, here's some tape, we really, really believe in it. We don't really want to faff around now, and, you know, we want to find out, basically, if people would like us to make that. And the best way to do that would be just to tell everyone, and just see if anyone's up for it. And in a way, there's something rather brilliant, and very route one about that. And, 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 uh, but there are also sort of downsides. So I what do you think, think the downsides are the fact that you don't get that. I think the downside is ultimately, you know, what this, this pitching that, you know, the fun and joy of a pitch is, isn't it, is that feeling it's like doing live telly. You're in a, you're in a room and you've got something you really, really care about that, and you want to communicate how much you care about it. And then someone's going to say something like, yeah, yeah, we're quite like that. I wonder though if that is a bit wrong. And you need to be, what I love about it is you need to be on it. You need to have an answer to that. You might be thinking on your feet or you might have discussed it with your team or one of your team. And that feeling of just really shaping something, high stakes of it, I love. It's quite an addictive process. The American thing seems to me you don't get to do that, or not as obviously, because it's more, here's a tape. More transactional, sure. More transactional. Although there are um, American buyers who do start giving you feedback. And then it's difficult because. There, there clearly is the expectation that you're going to take it to, to all their competitors. And if they have a good idea, that actually makes your idea better, well, you know, what, what do you pitch to the, to, the, to the competitor? Do you pitch the original idea or do you pitch it yes. with the adaptation that this person has suggested to you? Yeah. Um, I think the answer is you do. So the answer is you do both, don't you? There are times when you have a show. I mean, certainly at Endemol, in a way, it was, it was an easy process in the sense that anything that already existed in our IP, you know, there's a show that in Germany that was particularly exciting, 
or I'm trying to think of a more realistic example, um, or um, whatever. There was um, <laughs> that was deeply unfair. Um, there, there, there was a show um, in Germany that was exciting, and you could, you know, the broadcasters might even know about it here. But if they didn't, you could say, "Look, it's there." And obviously, I'm talking to two or three people because you know it's somewhat, it's more transactional. I think, in the absence of that. Um, you, you, you know, I suspect much more of the one-on-one -on -one stuff. But, you know, we, we have a show at the moment which, which is in the area of sort of food and you, and, and you sort of think, well, I can sort of see this on two or three chat. I can imagine it on two or three places. And we're having a conversation right now. I wonder if what we should do is just say, look, but very transparent. We're going to talk to two or three people. I hope you're okay with that. But we're talking to you first and we're going to go here a second. A bit, bit of both, I suspect. Yeah, I mean, there, was a, there was a funny thing. I was, remember being in a pitch... Um, at Fox um, a few years back um, in the US and you know that that transactional thing you say is so funny isn't it because what they were saying it was, it was you know good conversation we're talking about, and, then, and at one point they said what we really need is extreme home makeover now this was a big endemol show in the US um, which was about transforming people's houses and it was a really big noise and it was a massive show sort of in the mid 2000s and then you know like everything sort of had its day and here I'm, I'm, I am with someone quite important at Fox who's saying, we'd quite like extreme home. So I sort of said, well, well we've, 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 we've got extreme I mean, that's a show we have. Thinking, I think, I'm sure he knows that's an animal. We've got the show. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, I mean, not, not, obviously not home makeover, but that sort of show. So you're sort of in that weird world of right, right. No, of course, we couldn't, no, we wouldn't want to do that again. But I mean, it was so good, that show, he said. It was just everything about it was right. And I'm thinking... You know, we do have that show. That's, I mean, we could just be, I mean, no, 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 no. We wouldn't want to do exactly that. But, and you sort of find yourselves in those, often in those mad conversations, don't you, that sort of go around where you're sort of thinking, um, I think the answer is right in front of us, but we have to do that dance. And I think I quite like all that. Uh, ultimately, although it can be very frustrating, I quite like that very human, personal interaction where you're talking about something that really matters. Yes. And that quite often goes doesn't go anywhere, but the moments that it does, right? I mean, when, you've, when, when someone says to you, um, I think we're going to do this, I mean, actually, even as I say those words, that's quite an exciting thing to hear, isn't it? It's, I mean, how, I mean you still feel that's as... Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's often quite hard to get them to say it in the room. Yes. Um, actually, I had, uh, I had lunch with Andy Peters last week, who I haven't seen for a long time. He commissioned Shipwrecked, and Shipwrecked was the first show he bought. And... He, he, he tells a story, he's saying, you, you know, I, I really liked it. And, and you, you said, well, do you want to do it, Andy? And, and he thought, well, I, I don't know, is it as simple as that? Do I just say yes? And his assistant was there in the room with him, and she said, don't say yes. <laughs> he said, well, she says, I can't say yes, but I'll ring you in an hour and tell you that I want to do it. <laughs> so that, that's lovely. And why, why do you think people don't want to say it? in the room, because it's true. Actually, now I think about it, you very rarely get someone saying, if they say it, it's almost like if something embarrassing has happened, like, I think we're going to do it. And it's like, Christ, what's just happened? So it's very rare, isn't it? What's that about? Well, I think it's, it's the act of commitment and they probably want to check and they want to not do it in the rush of the moment. And I, I often find that a lot of the techniques that one learnt making documentaries are very applicable to um, getting people to say yes to a project. Go on, I mean, give us Well, I mean, often you don't... I, I often made documentaries with people and I never actually asked them whether they wanted to be in the documentary. Um, Is you, that, you, isn't that illegal? <laughs> <laughs> Is that how it used to be? <laughs> you never actually did the blunt question of, do you want to be in this? You would talk to them and befriend them and you would tell them you were making this programme and then you would tell them we'd want we're going to do a bit of filming with you tomorrow and you'd never actually get to the point of saying, oh, do you want to be in it or right. not be in it? Um, right. And the other thing I would learn from documentary was that to persuade people to let you have access to them, they, you can't be confrontational, but at the same time, if you agree with them completely, then they don't really trust you. So that you often need to half understand their point of view, whether they're South African riot policemen or Tamil Tigers, and then get them to explain how you've slightly got it wrong. And it's the act of right. them persuading, explaining how you've got it wrong that makes them feel that you right. have bought into them. 
and that they trust you and then they let you I didn't realise quite how cynical you were. It's extraordinary. <laughs> um, so when I, you're I, I find it works very well with commissioners. So, so tell me, how does it... So what do you do with the commission? So you mean well, you the, don't the, ask if the show is happening? You just no. sort of say, oh, look, it's appearing on television. <laughs> look, there's our, there's our show. How does that... How do you do that? You... Um, you, you it's... You'll have the meeting and it seems very positive and you will not get to the point of saying, is it happening, but more, well, this is how we're going to do it. And you make it sound like it's actually happening rather than, <laughs> and, and, and it's for them to have to say no to it happening rather than for them to have to say yes to it happening. This is extraordinary, isn't it? This is, <laughs> I think, so when I pitch the next show, I might just say, I've come here to talk about the second series of the show <laughs> and assuming it's all going ahead and, okay. So a bit of a bit of voodoo. The the um, what, what about what, the next bit? It says ratings. Why weren't they? I was only going to add. I was, no, we should do it. I was only going to add that. I was talking to someone the other day about about this and about pitching and so on. It occurred to me that one of the things. What if you didn't work in telly and weren't doing what you're all doing and what we're all doing? You'd think that the thing you'd spent most of your time doing when you're pitching or discussing a show is you'd think most of the time what you're both saying on both sides is what do you think about this idea? What do, what do you think about it? Would you like to do it? And to your point, I reckon that's about 1% of the time. And it's a funny thing because actually, in a way, that's what you should be. That's the only thing you need to be doing. The only thing you need to be doing is saying, here's how this show works. What do you think? But I think people probably on both sides, it's, people are funny about ideas and often quite uncomfortable about ideas and this notion of commitment, saying, I think that's a good idea, or I think I can see myself wanting to do that or watch it, oddly seems to be often the hardest thing to get out of someone. Yes. And it's a weird thing, isn't it? But also you can't... I mean, when they start expressing doubts about it, they might be right. But if you start agreeing with that, then yes. it's going to kill it. I mean, you can, you can agree with it if you've got a, a, a really powerful response. If you haven't got a very powerful response, you can't agree with yes. it because... Because it's so hard to get anything over the line. Because in the end of the day, there are very few slots relative to the number of ideas. And there are very few, um, you know, there are, there's a vast oversupply of producers. And there aren't that many buyers at the end of the day. And they don't buy that much. Yeah. Um, and so getting somebody to say yes is really difficult. I was in a pitch a few years ago, like quite a few years ago, to be fair with quite a scene on my side, on the producer side, quite a senior uh, person, um, uh, producer, and we were pitching the show and pitching it, I think it was the BBC, but it doesn't matter, and we're doing our thing and it goes like this and the show works like that and this happens and that happens. And then the producer next to me at a certain point said, but that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of the fucking pitch. <laughs> and, and I've, I've been, I mean, I mean, it's this sort of friendly fire, like literally, where do I run? And I remember thinking, Christ, this, I'm not, I, I don't think I can get out of this. She was wrong, actually. The thing did work, but it threw me so completely that that notion, and it's an interesting thing, isn't it? The notion of going in with your team and all being on the same page and having stress tested it and gone through it because cause you're... Yeah, sense, but again, I, I, I mean... There is sometimes something good if you're with the two or three of you trying to sell, and you have just a, if you present such a glossy, unified, kind of positive image about it, it doesn't ring true. Yes. And that to show that there's some debate between you, and that there's some you might all be very keen about it, but you've got this slight difference of opinion. What do you think? And they they might then arbitrate between you. And, well, they're this buying is in. This is your mind stuff. More voodoo it? stuff. Patty, how extraordinary. <laughs> well, I mean, all I'm saying is that credibility doesn't come from being, um, I don't know, a, 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 a black so, and white, sort of black so and black and white, white yeah. that you can't no admit. Yeah, I agree with that. So let's go, on, as you say, on to the ratings. Why won't uh, the buggers watch it? What do you think about launching new shows? So do you think, so let's maybe say... Well, I don't think you should. I think you should stick to all your existing hits. Yes. I should. Yes. Yes, we haven't got any, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that'll be tricky. But it's, what do you, th you know, do, you th do you think it is, it, is it now harder than ever to launch a new, should we say non-scripted, or are we not, look, let's, let's say non-scripted for the second. Sure. I think it's incredibly hard. Um, 
and we have very little control over whether a show is going to work because the fascinating thing about launching a new show is how many people come to it at the very beginning. You can see how the audience either builds across the hour or how it falls away dramatically. But getting them there in the first place mm. is, is, the, is, is, is the thing that our ability to control that is the title, I mean, obviously the concept and the title, although we don't have complete control of the title, the broadcaster can overrule us. Um, the fact that we've made the material for the show and therefore that is the material that the broadcaster will be using for their, for their trails and marketing, which again we might have some influence over, although ultimately they've got the control. But they've got the main levers because the main levers are where they're putting it in their schedule and how much of their marketing effort they put behind it. Um, and so it's... It's very hard to get, you know, you, you need their buy-in and their belief because to succeed very often, they need to decide to put it in those special places where a show has a real chance of, of launching. And even when they do that, people often don't turn up. I mean, we had an interesting flop this year with a show that we made for E4 called Vlogglebox, which um, attempted to do what we do with Gogglebox with young people watching on their iPads and on their phones yeah. um, stuff from the web. And it seemed like, surely that's going to work. Um, and yet n nobody came to it. Um, now, why didn't they come to it? Was it because it didn't seem... It, maybe it was a bad title. I mean, the trouble is... That, you, you never know why, or you do know, you can find out why a show didn't work because you can do focus groups and testing afterwards to try to understand why it didn't work. But certainly beforehand, shows that you think must work. I mean, uh, uh, Channel 4 went really big on a show that we did called Seven Days a few years ago. Yeah, I remember. And yet, again, it, actually, there I think they came in, but they didn't like the show. Um, so it was our mistake because I didn't realise how... Um, it was a mistake to have a community of people that we were filming and they were people that didn't know each other. Um, and they also, I didn't realise how much people in the rest of the country hate people from Notting Hill. They really do. <laughs> they really do. Most of Notting Hill people hate each other as well, so it's... Yeah. Um, but that's... How do you try to um, influence the success of a show once you've delivered it to a broadcast? And, how important is the re having a relationship with the, the scheduler? Because I often thought that the schedulers are key people to know and that um, anything that you can do to encourage them to support your show, actually at the very beginning, because often they'll be the person that the person who's ultimately going to make the decision to buy the show, the person that they will turn to most is their scheduler and the scheduler will have a huge influence. So I, I, how, what's your approach? So I, th I think definitely agree with that, talking to scheduler and trying. So I think it comes from, I've always felt, find it quite a natural thing to do to this notion of a partnership with the person, you know, the partnership with the broadcaster, because whatever sort of tussles to and fro there are on deals and terms and all the rest of it, you know, you are both going into it together. And it seems to me always really important that both sides are putting all their arguments into sort of like, what's the best way, as you say, to support this sh show. And I find myself thinking, you know, in, in the non-scripted world, you know, on the one level it feels, doesn't it, sometimes it feels slightly depressingly true that you think there was a certain time when you could say, do wife swap, and people go, you're doing what? You, that's the most ex outrageous idea I've ever heard. Or big brother, you know, putting people in for 24 hours under observation and you're like, what? And you can, you can watch them clean their teeth. And that sort of sense of innocence about new, sort of what felt like sort of new ideas that had come from outer space, like didn't seem to have anything to do with what had gone before. Of course they did, but it didn't feel like it. You sort of, on one level, you can subscribe to that notion that it was just all so new and innocent and now it feels a bit like retreading. On the other hand, I feel strangely, ridiculously, maybe this is how you're optimistic, about, you know, when you, when you watch a Love Island or whatever, you know, when, when, when something bucks the trend and, and, and you think, well, why is it doing that? Well, it's doing it because it's just bloody good. And, and, and I suppose there's a point at which you say you do everything you can, title, casting, concept, 
and then there's quite a nice moment when you just let it go when you've, there's actually not very much you can do, right? There's really nothing you can do to influence it. Um, and <coughs> I suppose it's a hits business, right? Even in those heady days of non-scripted, if that's what they were, you know, most things flopped, right? Most things failed. Yeah. Um, and then a few hits remained. And, 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 and I think encouraging, I don't know, I mean, who knows whether this is right or not? It's too early for me to tell with my company, but I think encouraging people to have that feeling of you can change the world with your ideas and we can be a place where you can just do the new. I mean, the one advantage, as you have, and, but I've got more of an advantage in one respect only, which is we have no, we're not burdened by our heritage of hits at expectation. I can tell you that for nothing. Um, so it's all completely new and there's something utterly invigorating about that. And I suppose I think we're going to have some hits. That's what I think. I think we're going to have some hits. They'll be slightly different, won't they? They won't be the same numbers, I'm guessing, as the numbers back in the day. But it feels like they'll be, we've got the right people to do it. So, so look, we have to be optimistic, right? That's how we feel. But we're ready for, I mean, my first show I ever came up with, I think I've said this before, I know it was, was a show called Flatmates, which was a sort of Channel 4 format, just before, literally just before Big Brother, so about about students choosing flatmates to live with. And it was, every, it was like, literally, I put my whole life into that. And as you know, you know, and, and was so proud of it. And I, and, and, and I couldn't believe it was on Channel 4 because Channel 4 was like the cool, literally the cool, because we were making sort of BBC shows like Changing Rooms and Red City Cook, which were amazing shows, but it would be pushing it to say they were cool. Um, and, and suddenly we've got, this, we've got this show on Channel 4 and I've come up with it. And it's like, and I remember watching it go out I remember that, you know that awful thing when the, you feel you should do it, you watch it with a team go out. It's sort of the worst thing you can do in the world, really, because all you're doing is watching the show, thinking, what do I think about it? And everyone's popping, you know, uh, back then they were popping champagne. Now it would obviously be a much more sober affair. Um, and, and I remember thinking, oh, fucking hell. Um, it's just edited. It's too fast. I mean, literally remember watching it thinking, it's too fast. I haven't... I'm not getting the story and keep smiling away and saying, well done to everyone. I'm thinking, we're so, I think we're sort of fucked. I think I've got this wrong. And as ever, I was right. Um, <laughs> and it flopped and it was just awful. And in a way, I've, I'm sure, it, I remember my boss was Peter Bazalgette um, at the time. And I remember how good he was about saying, in effect, how disappointing for me, you know, but also what have you got next? What's, what? What else are you thinking about? And I've always taken that, you know, as, as, as a, that, that's the way to do it. Because we can worry to a certain extent about whether these things are going to float. But what you really want to know is, OK, if not that one, which one? You know, and for people who, many of whom, who just can't help but have ideas and want to come up with stuff, you know, it has to be true, doesn't it? I know that, you know, we all hear it ad infinitum, but it has to be true that this is a great time to be doing it because there are so many people out there looking for that content. And yes, it's really tough on rights and it's really tough on audiences finding you and all, and all the rest of it but there are a lot of people hungry for ideas well that's a good segue maybe into the next section i meant it to be one it's um uh, we're, 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 our roots for both of us are unscripted but both at endemol and rdf we were involved in scripted companies and in your case you started a new company which will have a has a scripted side to it yeah. Um, at Studio Lambert, we've launched a, uh, a scripted division in the last couple of years, uh, and I'm also involved in a, a, a startup that's backed by all three that's a scripted company. So, despite our unscripted backgrounds, we are having some experience in scripted. What, what do you find the differences are? Well, so I think the difference is, so yeah, the, 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 the interesting thing for us is actually at Endemol, we, we bought Tiger Aspect, and that in a funny way, although we had some scripted stuff that was probably our big move into scripted so very so sort of suddenly I'm having meetings with Greg Brenman and others you know at Tiger and, and we're in the scripted world and I what I remember about it was thinking um, on the one hand this is absolutely no different from I'm meeting a creative who cares about what they're doing and, and has all the same problems that you know creatives face and so on um, and on the other how on the other how different this is you know and the most obvious is of course the time taken you know in non-scripted we're incredibly um we have incredibly short tension spans and perhaps and we like to have several ideas on the go and if not that one this one and so and scripted is of course in some senses feels more i suppose it feels this uh, this is not meant to sound um 
uh, pejorative, but you know, sort of more crafted or something. It, it, it takes longer and takes more patience. And I learned a lot actually from those early conversations with the Gregs and so on. And um, and then when Endemol Shine, you know, with the likes of this, I've just seen Lars Blumgren, who's in here somewhere, who's a personal hero of mine, um, who did the bridge amongst many other wonderful things. And meeting people who are prepared to take the time and put the hours in is, is a very different feel. And I really love that. I really love being able to sit with something. Um, you don't put the hours into your job normally. I've very rarely been known. There's one thing I've never been accused of. It's putting the hours into my job. Um, so, I, so I enjoy that. and I enjoy, uh, But in some senses... You know, it feels like it feels very familiar. Right? It is, and yes. Perhaps to you as well. It, yes, I think the big difference is uh, in unscripted. When you go off filming, you think that whatever we've said before, whatever we've written down before, well, that's all quite interesting. But now let's go and make a program. Mm. And you go filming, and you create lots of bits, and then you sit in the cutting room and you write your story. Mm using the bits that you've mm. captured from the real world. Um, scripted is, is so unlike that. I mean, scripted is the script. And the first thing you have to learn as an unscripted person coming to scripted is that when you read the script, it's a bit like reading a transcript of the cutting copy of your yes. unscripted show. And that's why all that work is done on the scripted, yes. uh, getting that script right, which takes a long time. And even then, a lots of shows get made that have got pretty terrible scripts. Um, and you can see why that is, that, that things acquire momentum. And it's so hard to get a script to show over the line that you know, the talent is lined up, the, 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 the people that you want to be in the, uh, are available, there's a, there's a good win for it. And despite the fact that so much work goes into getting that script right, very often things will happen even though Mm. I mean, it still isn't right, and yet you can't stop the train. Yes. Um, I mean, I think we, 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 one of the things I'm excited about with us is we've got a guy with us called Colin Barr who does, who cross, who does factual and factual drama. And so that's a, that's a sort of, has obviously, by definition, elements of both. He did the Damalola Taylor story for BBC One just for Christmas, for example, and he's got a couple of projects with us now. And I'm interested in, I think that's a really interesting world where, where you're doing both. But the other observation I was going to make about scripted, which is um, maybe scripted people in here will recognise this. Um, what is it about how quietly actors speak in, in read-throughs? Fucking hell. There's a sort of weird, there's a sort of weird competitive whispering thing in read-throughs. You know, not in comedy. If you do a read-through of Benidorm or, for example, you know, it's a riot. Um, if you do a read-through of, of, of any other, of drama, you get this thing where I think the actors need to demonstrate to you that they're so on top of their craft that they're not, they're not going to actually give you, they're not going to give you the full performance in, front, in the room. Gonna, so they read that... You think, I'll tell you what, mate, I know you can learn the lines. It's not what I'm testing. It's not quite like to hear you speak them. But um, that's, my, that's my one observation about scripted, which um, uh, I think, Lars, you'd be perhaps like to pick up on a, in the Q&A. Um, but no, but, but I, think, I think that we, we need to move on. We do need um, to move on. It's good, though, isn't it? I think, I think it's working well. Yeah. 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 Uh, we've talked a little bit about America. Why don't we jump to big versus small? Yes. Um, small. Small. Oh, sorry, I thought it was so, a competition. <laughs> What, what is, I mean, what are the challenges for the big organisation? The big, we've seen this amazing consolidation of the production sector. Um, how do big groups stay creative? What's your? Yeah, well, we've both been in a situation, haven't we, where we've been, um, I, 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 you know, responsible for <laughs> responsible for creativity in in a big organisation. And I think I think it's, um, you know, I really. I enjoyed every minute of doing it, and and but the thing is, Endemol was pretty big when it bought into the end to the UK operation, um, but it felt like we were growing it, and we did grow it, and we we grew through you know over a number of years, and that felt incredibly exciting. I don't think I ever joined it thinking I can't wait for the day this is a really big company because that's when I'll feel most at home, and and I think you know in a word the challenge is is. For the, for the for the big companies, as by the way it is for 
little expectation is growth, is how do you grow? Because not just growth for growth's sake, but growth is exciting. It excites the people within the company. It means, you know, we're very fortunate that what we all do here is we're, we're in a business that ultimately is creative and is, is, is a sort of public good. So when our companies grow, they're growing because we're making shows that are working. So it's a really good sign when your company uh, is, is, is growing. And I think, you know, the big companies have got big and Endemol uh, and, and Endemol Shine, no exception, because of shows being very big, most obviously uh, for Endemol Big Brother. Um, and, and those shows ultimately have a lifespan, right? And they have a massive, a much longer lifespan than any of us personally ever thought they would, but they have a lifespan. And so when you're dependent on those shows, it's a challenge. And when I was at Endemol, you know, it was, for, you know, it was, a, it was a challenge to how you move to the next step. But do you think um, that having a head of creativity for, um, for, for, for a group actually works? Because I didn't enjoy no, I didn't, uh, the I, time when I was um, yeah. creative head of what the RDF group. I was called chief creative officer. Because I always said I didn't want to be called chief creative officer because I, I, I didn't think I could do that job. Right. You felt you, as in I, I wasn't I sure what it was. It. No, I wasn't sure what it was. And, and, and I think that that's the difficulty. That I think... I think most people agree, and all three is the exceptionally good example of it, that the hey way to have a large group is to, as much as possible, have um, the, the a collection of companies that operate as creatively autonomous um, groups, uh, companies. And that if you try to bring everything together, that isn't a solution to creativity. And all three does that as I say, probably the most extreme version where the companies really do operate as separate companies and there's pretty much no shared yeah. intelligence between the companies. Most of the other groups have more shared intelligence and some of them have a creative head that's meant to be somehow encouraging creativity within the group. I think it's a really hard job. You don't know what you're meant to be doing, I found. I mean, if you start vetting the ideas before they go yeah, to the buyers, well, that's not going to work. I mean, first of all, why you? I mean, they, they, you might have the wrong opinion. Yeah. It kills their... If you actually try to do it, it would kill what was good about those companies. Mm. And yet, if you're not doing that, what are you doing? You're, you're there to oh, say... I agree. So, I, I, think that, I think that if you're going to have um, big groups, you have to do everything you can to encourage that... Um, that creativity that is best found in, 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 in particular companies with their particular approach and yes. to have a multiplicity of those rather yes. than to try to push everything together. I, I, I th I, exactly. And I think I'm, look, it's inevitable. You know, the bigger your company gets, the more you find, you could almost do a study, the more you mention the word creativity. It gets talked about all the time because you sort of have to talk about it because there is a big question, which is your question, which people are asking, which is, well, what, why are we this big and how do we remain creative and how do we interface with the buyers when they know there's this huge... So you talk about creativity a lot. And, and I felt, you know, I think I, I, I felt that I loved doing what I was doing right up until the moment, you know, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to move on. So I have no regrets about a single day of it. But I think that I probably couldn't have spent another day talking about creativity. I think I'd done, you know, other people should, should do that. And I think it's hard. And I remember being, on the other hand, as you say, you know, you're not coming up with hits yourself because you're busy talking to all the... So I, I think it's a, hard, it's, it's a hard one. But, you know, I remember being in a board meeting in New York in whenever it was, 2015, and um, this is a good story. <laughs> you, you know what it is, yeah? Yeah, I do. Um, uh, God, I hope it. I really hope it's the good one, because otherwise, because um, it's a really bad one and a really good one. Um, and and I'm sitting there with all sorts of brilliant people and people very very high up the 21st Century Fox, if I can put it that way, um, as high as you can get. And sitting there, and we're talking about Endemol Shine and there's loads of good things to say and it's one of them and, and so I'm enjoying it. And then there's this moment when someone says, uh, looking at this chart, there's a show, um, there's a show in, in, actually it's in Germany again, I've got no issue with Germany. Germany's run by a wonderful guy called Marcus Volta, so I don't know if it happened to be Germany. Germany has this show which seems to be doing really well and it's doing good numbers and everything. And I'm, I'm looking at it thinking, oh, fucking hell, I got no idea what that show is. I've literally no idea. And they're about to ask me, what is the show? And, and they turned to me and said, Tim, this, so this is, is this the new, what is this show? And I, th I thought, 
Well, by then I'm thinking I've got two options. I can sort of lie, which I've been known to do from time to time. I'll be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, and say, well, it's a sort of non-scripted, you know, it's really interesting show. It's a few key words without committing. The interesting show, you know, emotional, you know, lots of jeopardy. But I thought, do you know what? I'm just going to say the truth. And I said, I've no idea. I've absolutely no idea what that show is. And I sort of slightly felt then, by the way, this is the good story, so if that's your reaction, fuck no, no. you. Um, that isn't the good story. You've um, got a much better story. Oh, so it was the bad story. <laughs> wow. But it's a much better story. It was when he's sitting with some bankers. Oh, I know that. <laughs> yeah. Who were analysing everything I'll tell it if you like, Stephen. But... <laughs> no, because you'll tell it too long. I'll tell it quickly. And... <laughs> They analyse it. They said, we've worked out there are three different kinds of shows you do. There are these ones. There aren't many of them, but they're really big hits. Then you've got all these middle ones, and they're OK, but they don't, they're not as good as the big ones. And then you have all these little shows that don't do very well. So we've analysed this, and we thought, why don't you stop doing the middle ones and the small ones and just concentrate on doing the big hits? That is almost as good as I would tell it, and um, that's absolutely true. And I think... But you can't, in a way, you can't, in both those cases, for me, you, know, you can't blame a banker, as it was then, for, for looking at that, and, and that's probably how the car industry works. I'm not, you, know, you can't blame them, if you like, for thinking that, but you might, at a certain point, think, I can only have this conversation a few times. Life's, you know, only so short, someone else should probably... And then on the, on the, I thought, quite a brilliant story about the German show that I didn't recognise. Um, <laughs> We've got you, to think. We've you, got sort to part, you sort of partly think, I think I've been here a bit too long, is what you think. And, and why not? Well, we're in danger of being here right, too so long. And there's a few moments left for, for any questions. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was wondering if you'd like to return the favour and suggest who you think should get Jay's job. Stephen, are you interested in taking the Channel 4 job? I am not interested in taking Are you, ru are you what broadcaster would say, ruling yourself out? I'm ruling myself out. Yeah, Chris? Are you ruling yourself out? I am ruling you out and me out. I'm ruling both of us out, yes. Uh, it's a hard one, isn't it, that Channel 4 one? Because you, you, I know who you would like, but I'm not going to put you on the spot unless you want to say it. Actually, why would you say it? Um, but um, it definitely feels like, doesn't it, another generation, perhaps another generation now <coughs> in, which can only be a good thing, I think, and that maybe the person who gets it isn't, maybe, isn't what people will say is a sort of heavyweight hit hitter. In other words, that's usually code for someone who's already doing a sort of channel controlling job. It's not going to be someone like that. So um, who knows, but it feels like um, it's another generation and that could be quite exciting, right? We need Channel 4 to be exciting, so... We're feeling good about it, aren't we? Oh, yeah, we are feeling very good about we're it. We're being moved on. Well, I'm just, we've got very little time. That's, you've absolutely made a fundamental error and given a question to broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Tim. I'm not sure I quite agree that it's a fundamental error. <laughs> um, Stephen, you said something interesting earlier, and I wonder for both of you... One thing. Un ...unpack it a little bit. Several things. <laughs> um, you said there's a massive oversupply in the, in the indie sector. I wonder, the question for, for both of you is, are, are there too many indies at the moment? Yes, I think they should be licensed, like taxi, taxi cabs, and you pass them on these licenses to your children. Um, are there too many? If there are too many, then they'll go bust. And um, so, I mean, in that sense, the market will dictate how, whether, they, whether there are too many. Um, I do think that broadcasters sometimes get, particularly Channel 4, gets too head up about how many independents they work with. I don't think that you maximise creativity on the screen by thinking that we need as many independents to work with as possible, and that I do think that sometimes it's better for people to, who are creative to, to have the right deal with an existing independent rather than all that energy that goes into setting up a company and worrying about all the stuff that's not to do with program making and that yes obviously there are rewards if you make your company successful but lots of it's quite hard to do that and that um, I don't think we sh I don't think broadcasters particularly Channel 4 should obsess about the number of independents that they work with and I, I would uh, I would say because uh, I know Chris you've written pieces about this but I'm not sure how meaningful it is in the sense that when would you know if there was the right amount? I don't know what that would look like. And as Stephen says, 
you know, there, are, there, are there too many super indies? I don't know. Or maybe there are not, not enough. I mean, I don't know how you know when you've got, and as, as Stephen says, you know, you'll know if your particular indie is excess to requirements because you won't have got commissions and you've got to go and do something else. And so, so I, I don't know where at least, but, but I think that what is happening, I mean, I think we agree on this, is there definitely is something in the air about people saying, I'd quite like to have a go myself. And is that a is that a reaction to consolidation? I don't know, or is it a, is it just you know the fact that um, is, are there are other factors? Who knows? But I think there's definitely something out there. And what's fun and interesting for those people is that they can do deals with the big producers, the all threes and endemols and so on, or they can do it on their own, or they can do it with a private equity. I and mean, there's any number of ways to cut it. And there's definitely people who are quite excited about that. Whether they're all going to be as successful as Stephen Lambert, who knows? But you'd imagine not all of them will be. But it's worth a go, isn't it? The prize is so good, you might as well have a go. Is there one more question? We don't, no one seems to be telling us to stop, so if there's any other. Oh, <laughs> fuck. Let's take one more question. We'll take, we'll take this question from this chat. Do, do you want to ask your question? Or, or? Yeah, just shout it out because it's they may have... Um, oh. Thanks. We were talking about um, how hard it is to have hits nowadays and being reliant on the schedulers. I mean, Stephen, you've benefited with Gogglebox from a very quiet launch and Jay in particular particularly believing in that and then taking a, you know, a calculated risk with that on a Friday night and a similar sort of story with First Dates she mentioned yesterday at uh, 2020. Is that becoming increasingly rare do you think? Are those very specifically unusual examples? Do you think there are enough broadcasters and commissioners passionately believing in those shows that will eventually find a home? Uh, I think that I think you just need to analyse what's going on with those shows when people decide to stick with them. I mean, I can't remember the details of first dates. Certainly with Gogglebox, it, it, even the first series, but certainly the second series, every episode it was building. So once you see a graph that's going in the right direction, that should give you the confidence as the buyer to, to keep going with it. I think... Um, I think the much harder thing to do is to keep going with a show where the graph isn't going in that direction. And it's pretty much impossible to, to keep going with a show if the graph is going in the wrong direction. Um, so I think it's, it's it, it, particularly if you launch a show in a quieter part of the schedule, it's much more to do with what the, what's happening in terms of whether the audience is building um, rather than what is the overall audience at that point. I think we should. So, if this is a format that's worked, I think I do suggest it has one flaw, which is I'm not sure how you end it. <laughs> so, we might need to work on that. But I'm going to say thank you to Stephen. I bet uh, you say thank you to me now. And I'm going to say thank you to Tim. Oh, and thank you for, to all of you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>